thick areas. Uh, yesterday, we looked at data protection and privacy in the context of national security, cyber security. Uh, and then um, in the second session, we looked at um, from the perspective of artificial intelligence. And we had really had interesting um, comments from the participants, uh, vibe and presentations from our, um, our speakers. And what we have today really promises to be also another interesting session. So in this particular session, we will look at privacy data protection and specifically focus on vulnerable groups. And we are looking at women, we are looking at children, we are looking at uh, the LGBTI community, we are also looking at uh, social assistance beneficiaries. Um, if you are seeing that, we know we are embracing technologies, um, accessing internet. Um, children as well are using um, the, the you know, gains are being accrued from using this technology as well. And um, you can see that children are using technologies in their education, they can access online counseling. The women's rights movement as well has really grown um, using technologies. And also, if you are looking at the LGBTI community, they have also managed to embrace technologies and use them um, in different ways. And um, at the same time, there are really um, challenges around um, personal information when you are looking at these uh, this, uh, groups. And um, if you're looking at social assistance beneficiaries, for example, um, their information, you will find it in the hands of um, a lot of service providers with their, without their consent. And when also when it comes to children, they are also vulnerable. And a lot of questions have been raised around the rights of the children's right to privacy vis-a-vis -vis parental guidance, and also issues around protecting our children from accessing harmful content. How do you ensure that children have access to the appropriate content and at the same time protect their right to privacy? And um, also, when it comes to online counseling, how do you balance, you know, confidentiality and also, you know, access to, to, to that counseling? And, um, you know, how do you ensure the evolving capacities of, of children as well? And again, when we are looking at women, there are also different dynamics to look at it. I will leave that to our experts to lead us in the different discussions that we are going to have. But um, as they are presenting their papers uh, based on the different themes, please feel free to um, comment on their presentations, to critique their presentations. You might have a different view. Um, you might have another way of looking at it. Uh, you can also bring that to, to their attention. Please use the chat section. It is a very free space. It's a free academic space, it's a free space of engagement. Let's engage on these issues, let's sharpen each other uh, through commenting on, um, on, this, on these presentations. So like I've said, we are going to have um, hopefully four presenters. So we will start off with um, Obed and, and Dokas. Um, Obed and Dokas are presenting on Obert and Dokas are presenting on privacy and data protection law, and they are specifically focusing on vulnerable subjects. And um, in terms of their bios, Dokas is a PhD student at the University of South Africa, and her research is focusing on uh, the treatment of intersex and transgender people in the criminal justice institutions in Zimbabwe. She is a former public prosecutor with experience in child justice law, cyber law, social justice, criminal law, criminal procedure, and also constitutional and human rights law. And she has also worked as a human rights defender and a programs lawyer in the civil society sector. And at the moment, she is currently working as a legal research officer at the Center for Applied Legal Research in Zimbabwe. She'll be presenting the paper with Obet Bore who is a legal practitioner and a researcher with professional experience in the area 
as of constitutional um, constitutional law, human rights law, democracy and governance, and um, Obed also holds um, an LLM with a distinction in international trade from the University of Cape Town and is also a former legal researcher for the Democratic Governance Research Unit, which is based at the University of Cape Town. Uh, Obed is also, is also working with um, Dorcas and is a senior legal research officer at the Center for Applied Legal Research in Zimbabwe. So their presentation is focusing on vulnerable groups, looking at data protection and privacy. I am now handing over to you, Obet and Dorcas, and I'm giving you 15 minutes to do the presentation. After your presentation, you will um, attend to questions and comments that will be raised by uh, our participants. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lenue. Good morning to all particip participating. Uh, this is Dorcas Dichio speaking. I will be presenting with um, Albert Bore, my colleague. And, and I would just like to ask if you can confirm, if you can see uh, our shared screen, Madam Moderator. Yes, please, please proceed. Thank you. All right, so this is the structure of our presentation. I will breeze through the introduction, definition of concepts, and speak a bit on the risks to data protection in the digital era. I will then also speak briefly on vulnerable data subjects and hand over to my colleague who presents to you how this concerns uh, to the theories on vulnerability, which we have merged to vulnerable data subjects. I will also briefly introduce who we are calling the vulnerable data subjects. Obet will then conclude by speaking on uh, how this concept has been tackled in the African legal regime on data protection. And then uh, thereafter, there will be conclusions. Colleagues, as you may have heard from Slenyue, this concept has been spoken about throughout uh, the um, conference. So this is just a matter of revising these concepts. And, uh, on that note, I would like to say on the right to privacy concerns have gained new importance as a result of the risks linked to data privacy concerns. The heightening of this concerns is as a result of things like uh, the amount of data that can be collected, the processing, the transmission speed, and the increased storage capacities for data processors. This also increases the possibility of manipulation of personal data. The right to privacy in this presentation is thus linked to the equal protection of the law and human dignity that can be promoted in the digital era while simultaneously promoting secure ways of data use, collection, storage, and sharing of personal information for vulnerable data subjects of society, who include the LGBTI community, children, elderly people, and persons living with disabilities, particularly mental disabilities. Now onto the basic concepts, there is the concept, the phenomenon of uh, data privacy, which gained a lot of uh, prominence in the later part of the 20th century as a consequence of the internet. Uh, this has resulted in exponential rate of adoption of information and communication technologies that are um, data driven. Um, data protection, what it is, this concept is um, how personal information is handled by third parties, that is the collection, the processing, the transmission and storage. So it is an aspect of uh, privacy. So what is personal data protection, one may ask? It's, this relates to any information related to identified or identifiable natural persons. An example of personal data include the name, the surname, the place of birth, place of residence, nationality, and email address. And uh, this has also even been uh, said to include different pieces of information which collected together can lead to the identification of a particular person. So on the concept of privacy in the digital era, the right to privacy and data protection are related yet distinct concepts that have areas of intersectionality in the digital space. And these areas of intersectionality are also what result in um, the vulnerabilities which we'll speak more on. What is privacy? I'm sure you may have heard throughout this, uh, the presentations that were made that privacy is defined as the claim of individuals, groups, or institutions to determine for themselves when, how, to what extent information about them is communicated to others. Now we are talking about this concept in relation to the digital era. Protection from what, one may ask. Uh, we are seeking, we are talking about data protection due to the ICT developments that have created more efficient ways for collection of data by third parties and, and in some instances governments, the implementation of data-driven technologies, which I've alluded to. 
And uh, we are speaking about the exploitation that may result of certain individuals like uh, the LGBTI community, the people living with uh, disabilities, children and the elderly who we have termed vulnerable data subjects. Digital security breaches have the potential to undermine human rights, such as the right to privacy. It leaves data subjects susceptible to physical or economic harms, intangible harms such as damage of reputation, intrusion on one's life, and may even have dire consequences which can result in societal ostracization and uh, may spiral into other things that may even result in loss of life for someone who feels dejected. So for protection from what? We are saying there is need for protection of these vulnerable data subjects uh, to, due to the digital risk that can undermine their privacy, especially where there are no adequate protections on who, who has access to that data collected, how long that data is protected, and who it is shared with. Digital communications and technologies can be manipulated for invasive surveillance, interception of communications, as well as exploitation of personal data. What is inevitable are digital security risks that undermine privacy. Let's, we have to agree on that. However, there are levels to the risks that we are, that data subjects are, are susceptible to. How do we avoid these risks and challenges? Sufficient legal frameworks can be set up to regulate and deter security breaches. Uh, what we would call universal digital risk, a perennial risk associated with data privacy, the breach of security of that data. What constitutes data breach? Intentional or unintentional and unlawful release of secure or private and or confidential information. It is a security violation as it exposes confidential, sensitive, or protected information to an unauthorized person as a result of the sensitive, protected, or confidential data being copied, transmitted, viewed, stolen, or used by an individual unauthorized to do so. So why are we speaking about the universal theory of uh, vulnerability? We are, what we are essentially saying is that in as much as there is risk associated with uh, using uh, being in the digital era, and in as much as that, as that risk is there for everyone, there is certain risk or heightened risks that are associated with vulnerable data subjects. They are identifiable, uh, they identified vulnerable data subjects. And um, they may be affected by age, mental capacity, particularly that of a child or a person living with a mental disability, gender as well as sexual orientation. These vectors can impact on the enjoyment and execution of individual data rights. These vectors also make their privacy and data security highly susceptible to data security breaches, data exploitation and abuse. There are consequences associated with the digital risk and with data protection. Inadequate protection of the right to privacy and data protection can undermine the enjoyment of other rights for, for every data subject, such as freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, general access to civil and political rights guaranteed in the international in instruments such as ICCPR and the Banjul Charter. Mitigating these digital risks should be a priority. It is not possible to eliminate all digital security risks. This should, however, be mitigated, particularly for the identified vulnerable groups. This is because vulnerable data subjects are more susceptible to harm than the universal vulnerability that comes from the use of digital information systems and technologies for every data subject. So what is the first with vulnerability with certain data subjects? The notion of vulnerability is vital in situating the position of an individual who can be classified as a vulnerable data subject in the context of collecting, storing, processing, and sharing of data. Example of data-driven technology practices that expose some data su subjects to this, uh, the request for data on sexual orientation or to indicate whether or, or not they are a, a data subject is living with a disability. Yes, this may be also to um, adapt or moderate systems to their liking, but it can also have residual risks. There is a risk that, and this constitutes an added layer of vulnerability for members of the LGBTI who can be subjected to discrimination and persecution, including criminal prosecution in countries where homosexuality is criminalized if their personal data is divulged. Let's say, should there be a data security breach? So we have theories of vulnerability, and uh, these theories of vulnerability, when we discuss them in our paper, we then link them to data protection of vulnerable data subjects. Human vulnerability is present in relation to all data protection, privacy, and data technologies. According to the universalistic theory of, um, of defining vulnerability, privacy and data protection safeguard all individuals equally in digital ecosphere. This understanding is on the basis that all data subjects are equally exposed to violations. It is argued that universal vulnerability exists as evidenced by power imbalance between the data subject, data co collecting, controlling institutions which store, analyze, and can share this 
with other entities. Allow me at this stage, Madam Moderator, to hand over to my colleague, uh, Obed Gore, who will speak more on theories of vulnerability and give examples that we identified of how this concept of vulnerability intersects with uh, data, vulnerable data subjects. Thank you so much, Dukas, for that. Um, so I'll proceed from the theories of vulnerability. Uh, first, to understand why this notion is important in situating uh, subjects, data subjects that we identify as vulnerable, we need to also understand where the concept come from, where it comes from, and also the theories around that concept of vulnerability. So the concept of vulnerability can be used to articulate problems of inequality, power imbalances and social injustices. And based on this concept, conceptualization, we explore the notion of vulnerability in the field of data protection through examining the existent digital risks that every data subject is exposed to and those that are exposed to vulnerable data subjects. And we have also looked at the different national legislation uh, to find out and ascertain if they are adequate in terms of providing protection to the different identified categories of data subjects. And as my colleague has already alluded to the fact that universal theory uh, mainly speaks to the fact that every data subject is vulnerable. Uh, but however, the particularity theory, it goes a step further in articulating that uh, while all data subjects are vulnerable, some subjects are more vulnerable than the others because their information is likely to be abused, exploited, and those people are more likely to be harmed uh, as a result of the peculiar circumstances uh, that are applicable to these categories. And factors such as age, disability, and sexual orientations, they come into play when determining which data subject are more susceptible to violations or abuse of their personal data. So because of these differences in the level of uh, vulnerability, certain individuals, certain individuals and uh, persons have responsibilities to ensure that data-driven dri technologies and information technologies are alive to the vulnerabilities of different data subjects. And for lawmakers, uh, our argument we are advancing is that there must be enough legislative provisions that are alive to the vulnerabilities of different data subjects and provide enough protection. So in identifying the vulnerable data subjects, we used this particularity theory, uh, which is different from the universality theory because it is tenable um, on the basis that sub different data subjects have different levels of understanding and decisional capacity making as a result of the various factors such as age, disability, and sexual orientation that we have alluded to. By, by way of example, uh, vulnerability is mostly associated um, in, in cases where notice or consent or choice is used uh, to determine whether information is collected from a data subject and processed by a data processor or used. Uh, this notice and consent concept uh, basically is, uh, it articulates that when collecting information uh, from data subjects, collecting entities uh, would have given notice about their information to be information to be collected and when a data subject has made a choice by agreeing either by clicking a button to say i agree or if it's a cookie that pops up on a web page then you agree the assumption is that we have given uh, ex ante um, consent before your information is used or processed but however uh, this takes away the informational privacy of data subjects, which is the ability to determine for oneself when information may be collected, how it may be collected, what it may be used for. And there are certain risks that vulnerable data subjects um, are likely to face. And uh, with regards to the notice and consent premise, the, the, there is an impractical expectation that everyone understands the elaborate disclaimers in terms of engagement. Uh, with data collecting entities, which is obviously untrue. For instance, children would not obviously comprehend or understand um, and also what they are agreeing to. So what that means is that when they do not understand what they are agreeing to, uh, they cannot give informed consent for the collection and the use of their information, unlike adults who obviously have uh, better decisional capacity and level of awareness and understanding their rights 
and also the terms of agreement or conditions. So as we have already stated that children is a, a particular peculiar vulnerable uh, group um, because of the fact that they obviously cannot make decisions without the informed consent of, of their parents. Uh, and Ching Yeo has also alluded uh, well, before we just started uh, this session. Robert, you should be rounding up now. Please conclude. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that. So we have um, outlined that children are data, um, vulnerable data subjects because of their limited capacity to understand complexities of the data-driven architecture and also the experience and lack of awareness and rights. Uh, same applies to elderly persons who are also identified as vulnerable um, because they, you have limited uh, knowledge on how to use ICT systems. And there's also a possibility of their personal data being used for criminal activity or, or such as fraud or identity theft. Same applies with persons living with disabilities. And we have to be bear in mind that the Convention on Protection of Rights for Persons with Disabilities, it guarantees personal protection, which extends also to personal data uh, in the digital space. And this, uh, group is also susceptible to, to their personal data being abused for criminal activities. Um, when we move to the LGBTI community, um, in countries where the homosexual acts or sodomy or same-sex marriages are not recognized or homosexual acts is criminalized, this group is likely to be more vulnerable than the members of the community. And um, so from our study, what we have noted um, through the this uh, paper is that there are countries which have there are countries which has adopted a particular approach in their national legislation, and they have provided explicit protection with regards to children. And while there are other countries that have not done so, but by way of example, Ghana, Kenya, and South Africa and Tunisia, they have particular protection that are targeted to children to avoid misuse of their personal data. But in terms of um, elderly. The elderly do not have uh, particular protection, which means countries have not adopted a particular approach which bears in mind or which considers the particular needs of uh, elderly persons. Same applies with persons with disabilities. But however, for uh, the LGBTI community, we have uh, noted that there's a, there's a blanket prohibit prohibition against processing of personal information, like for example, in South Africa, um, however, the difference in South Africa is that uh, homosexual activity of concerning adults is lawful and uh, so same-sex marriages are lawful and therefore they, there is some bit of, um, is some bit of uh, recognition and protection offered to this group. Um, as a way forward and recommendation, having ascertained the extent to which the national legislation lacks sufficient and legal uh, policy um, recognition of the different vulnerabilities that different groups are associated with. Um, we, we are proposing that there is need for explicit, explicit protection, uh, rather there should be also a particularity ap approach which is adopted through legislation by ensuring that there's enough protection which uh, takes into account the needs of the, the different data subjects. Uh, and further to that is also incorporation of a risk-based approach in the African data protection regime where obligations are placed on data controllers to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to explore and to ensure compliance with data protection principles. In addition to that, there should also be um, some form of obligation on data processors and controllers to ensure that they conduct uh, vulnerability layers assessments. And in conclusion, um, I would like to also just allude to the fact that Data protection authorities, where they exist, they need to be operationalized so that they are able to monitor compliance. Uh, so thank you so much, Lenyua. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we can end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dokas and Obed, and um, Obed for the for the elaborate presentation on on focusing on vulnerable groups. There is a question here, and it's saying that um, in line with the particularity theory. What sort of provisions do we expect to have in our national legislation to protect data subjects um, who may be data subjects who may be identified 
to be more vulnerable and stand to suffer double jeopardy, uh, which may be perpetrated by age, sexual orientation, and other identified factors. Maybe in just um, a minute, you can respond to that. All right, thank you, Senior, for that. Um, uh, thank you for the question. The question, in part, has the answer. Using the particularistic theory, we will be proposing that there should be explicit provisions that uh, guarantee that, uh, in addition to the vulnerable vulnerability that is associated with every vulnerable data sub every data subject, there should be explicit provisions that speak to uh, these. Uh, identified vulnerable data subjects. And this will enable data protection authorities when they are enacted, actually put this on the checklist to see how is the data controller um, handling certain information. So in that regard, uh, a data controller will not only have to satisfy that they have um, um, complied with the general aspects of uh, protecting data or preserving certain principles in how they are um, processing of every data subject. I hope that helps to answer. Um, thank you for, for the response. There is another question from, from Emmanuel and it's with regards vulnerability. And the question is, when is, is it exacerbated at the point of, of collection? It says, I have a question on the issue of vulnerability when it, ex it is exacerbated at the point of collection, storage or processing. Also, he is asking you to comment on access to information technology by vulnerable persons and its effect. And uh, there is also another one uh, by, by priv privilege, and she's saying um, directly referring to Orbit. What of the countries like Zimbabwe, where LGBTI is a crime? Um, and they have been attacked and even traced using data processing. How can they be processed? Maybe you can respond to both questions, uh, Obet and Dokas. Okay, uh, thank you. I will um, allow my colleague to pick up since it's been directed to him. But uh, I, I, I must say, in fact, let me just uh, let him speak. Okay, uh, thank you so much for, for the questions. Um, so I'll first uh, deal with the question relating to LGBTI, particularly in Zimbabwe, where same-sex mar marriages are not um, recognized and uh, the LGBTI community is likely to be attacked. Uh, clearly, I think this is exactly what we, we are saying in our paper, that uh, when we adopt a particularity approach, which is which is actually taking into account the peculiar needs of that particular group, in this case being LGBTI. If the law does recognize that uh, the personal information, let's say for instance, you, you, you want to access a particular service on the internet and there is need for one to disclose your gender or your sexual orientation, where the information in our um, uh, national legislation it does pr provide explicit provision to the effect that um, particular information in relation to sexual orientation must not be uh, disclosed and authorized to, to other entities if it has been um, collected from a person who is a member of the LGBTI, that information should not be disclosed to third parties. There is need for further um, if I may put it like going back to the data subject to obtain consent before the information is transmitted to another person, because that the same problem that we have is that if the information has been collected and mishandled, you will find uh, that there are instances where these people will be attacked. And when they are attacked, it means there's no enough protection for them. They cannot go to the courts because the law does not recognize the same sex marriages. So you cannot argue before the court say, uh, my information was unauthorized, uh, or it was disclosed unlawfully. The law is silent, it doesn't provide for this. So there's no protection on these people. So this is why we are saying if we adopt a particularity approach, we will then have provisions that are clearly stipulating how 
data pro, uh, processors and controllers are supposed to process information. And also then the data subjects, they will have to understand their rights if the legislation explicitly provide for these rights. And this can be done through having uh, data protection principles, which clearly outline the, 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 the obligations of data pr processors. I hope I have uh, answered this question. Um, so I can move to the next one. I think the next one uh, related to access, access to information and maybe Tling, you can just remind me. Um, Emmanuel was saying also, can you comment on access to information technology by vulnerable persons and its effect? Okay. Um, okay, access to information, yeah, it, it is a fundamental right uh, in the Zimbabwean constitution and in other uh, many constitutions. It is recognized that access to information is a fundamental freedom. And uh, this also extends to uh, issues of uh, facilities and uh, the fact that in other countries, in other countries, there's um, there's an issue of connectivity, which also comes into play. There's an issue of um, security that comes into play. If we look at, uh, for instance, in the current sphere, uh, in the in the current COVID pandemic, uh, we had an interesting case uh, in Zimbabwe where um, the the courts then told authorities that they were supposed to disclose information, particularly to, I think it was to persons uh, living with disabilities, persons with living with disabilities on how to protect themselves, on protect themselves from the pandemic. And that is a perennial issue uh, because not everyone has access to information uh, through to different, I mean, through, through, through either print media or through social media or other platforms that, that are there. Uh, and obviously we know the reasons why not everyone has access to information, even in countries, even in countries that are well developed, there's still some, some repression and censorship. But this is, a, I think, an area that also my, 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 my colleague can comment on since she is an expert. Thank you, Senue. Do I have time to quickly just uh on to what Obeti said. <laughs> 30 seconds. Thank you, thank you so much. On that aspect of access to information and relating to the uh, theories of vulnerability, we see that when there is repression of, um, of information, particularly where we have um, uh, countries like Zimbabwe, where uh, certain ex are uh, uh, criminalized, consenting say, ex of individuals, a, a member of the, let me give you an example of how this can play out. A member of the LGBTI community may go on the internet to search on questions relating to their health. This actually increases, uh, this actually adds a layer of vulnerability because if there's any data breach, they may have been seeking, the information they've been seeking to empower themselves may, may, may actually expose them as to their orientation or their, or, or, uh, or it may also expose their, uh, their, their, their health condition or whatever it is that they were seeking to find out. So it is a double-edged sword in this regard. And uh, we explore it thoroughly in our paper and uh, in the interest of not abusing the uh, courtesy extended, I will end there. Uh, <clears throat> let me just bring to your attention, you don't have to respond to it, the question by uh, Sukati and it says that who is supposed to have access uh, who is supposed to have access to this information repositories in country, regional, and, and international? You can see it is the last comment on the on the chat section. But now we are going to move on to our next presenters, and uh, these are Peace Oliver Amuge and um, Sandra Aseng. Uh, Peace is um, an, an acting coordinator of uh, Women of Uganda Network, and she's a communication specialist and digital human rights activist. Uh, she has undertaken research on different topics on women's rights online. And also she is a member of the Global Internet Governance Forum on strengthening and strategy, working on, um, she's also a working group member of the Association of Progressive Communications, communicators on the landscape and intersectionality for environmental justice and ICT and a board member of uh, Center for Multilateral Affairs. And her co-presenter is Sandra Aseng, and Sandra is a project officer 
at um, Women of Uganda Network, and she coordinates a caucus called Women ICT Advocacy Group, and she's a contributor for Global Voices, GNI Internews, 2020 Fellow and the 2020 Tala Program Fellow by Defend Defenders. And she has attended quite a number of trainings. And their presentation is on the status of women and children's privacy and data protection in Uganda. Over to you, Peace and Sandra. Thank you very much. And thank you very much everyone who has made time to join today. Uh, Diva has, has already introduced me, so I would just like to go straight to sharing my screen. And Diva, you could just let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, I can see the screen. Do you see my screen? OK, and yes. then I would uh, mute my video so that I can have I can have good, I can at least assure myself of a good connectivity. So our presentation is, our paper is on the status of women and children's privacy and data protection in Uganda. We pick out on some of the issues that are happening now despite us having the, the data protection and privacy a year ago and Sandra will also have and what we ought to do. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, Dokas and Obed for some of the some of the pre I don't know why I cannot move my screen. Excuse me a little bit. Okay yes I can move it. Okay, so we speak on women and children and we, as uh, the previous speakers have already uh, told us that these are really vulnerable groups. Women are very vulner vulnerable to uh, data breaches or privacy breaches and children are even more vulnerable as their capacity to understand the long term impacts of sharing personal data is still developing and also we see that even uh, uh, women who live in rural areas or women who are illiterate, illiterate are even more vulnerable to, to data breaches. So in Uganda, we passed the act, yes, we have it, but we do not have the regulations in place yet to operarize op its uh, uh, proper implementation. And then we also uh, know, and this is something that is probably also experienced in other countries that already have uh, data privacy act that there is no public awareness about the act or how we can uh, protect and uh, uh, the, protect the data that we have as individuals or organizations or companies. So the uh, the communities lack awareness about data breaches, and then we they, we also realize that you the privacy act the Uganda Privacy Act lacks agenda specific provisions, you know, to protect women and girls. Uh, so this is a challenge that we see with the act that we have. And also we realize that there is still, you know, unregulated data collection and processing by individuals, company and the government in Uganda. And this still is a big threat to, 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 to data privacy. I would like to go a little bit and, and point out, you know, some of the issues with data protection when it comes to children. You realize that during the pandemic, so many children came online to use the internet for, you know, entertainment, to access their classwork, to, uh, to socialize. And they are, they're very vulnerable because they are joining online platforms. They've uh, been able to create, uh, to create, uh, profiles and yet children are not supposed to, 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 to have profiles in some of, these, uh, some of these platforms. But of course, sometimes they lie because they want to be part of those profiles. And this is really, this, this really bridges their privacy you know, right, the right they have to privacy. We also realize that uh, during the outbreak, you know, so many children have come online and they're sharing their personal data, they're sharing their information, personal information, you know, without knowing that it is wrong, without knowing, you know, the implications with this. And we've seen uh, in Uganda, a lot of issues come up uh, out of this. And also we see sometimes that 
parents themselves also share children's uh, personal data. And this has, uh, affects children's uh, privacy. So, uh, and yet in the act, the act requires that data collectors should obtain consent from parents or guidance before collecting data relating to children, you know, and failure to this, you know, attracts penalty. But that is not being put into practice. We see a lot of data being shared. Schools also are sharing data of their children or uh, of their pupils or students, if I may, if I may uh, call it that way. And no one is following up to, to really see that the practices, you know, are in line with the, the law that we have. Definitely, we still have a challenge because we don't have the regulations in place, you know, and so this becomes really a problem. And unfortunately, you know, not, not all, not, we are not well prepared even in all these with this mechanism, despite the fact that, you know, the legal framework seeks to create a safe uh, cyberspace for children. You know, this can still be attributed to ignorance on the side of parents or guidance and uh, incompetence of the law enforcers. You know, so children are, are become very vulnerable. Children are accessing harmful content and no one seems to really, you know, uh, see that this is really uh, a big issue. And we need to really uh, think of ways to, to, to cap this down. And then I want to also point out some of the issues that are also happening in Uganda. For instance, uh, when we talk about a general elections, next year Uganda will be voting and uh, our elections uh, and campaigns are being done digitally. So that means everyone has to come online to access information about their political aspirants, to access information about voter registration, to access different information regarding to uh, elections. But this is putting everyone at risk, is putting uh, so much, and there's a lot of uh, data being collected. Uh, and uh, people are not aware, you know, of how this infringes on their rights. People are easily giving out their information to their political parties, to register as members or as, as, as candidates. And, you know, women are very much vulnerable to this kind of uh, info data being collected and processed, you know. And, and, and the worst of it is that data is being collected and people, there's no clear notification or clear, you know, communications on how long this uh, data will be kept, retained. Because the law provides that at least the data subject should be aware of how long, you know, their data will be retained. But we realize that uh, a lot is happening and we do not know when this would be uh, probably deleted. And also another thing, of course, related to the COVID-19 pandemic that has been, that has affected everyone globally. We see that now in Uganda, the motorbike riders that we locally call border borders are collecting details of their passengers. And then we also see shop uh, operators, worship places, registering worshipers, you know, they register personal details. When you go to the bank these days, we have to register, we have to leave our contact of where we live and all these details, you know. It still comes back to, you know, these people are already data collectors, but do they even know that they are data collectors that the law talks about? And do they know uh, what they need to do, what they need to, uh, the, how they need to uh, protect the, the people's data that they're collecting, you know, as data, data collectors. So this is really a, a challenge that we see and it is really increasing. Uh, and, and yet no one seems to, to even pay attention. Very few people are aware of uh, this, this uh, these uh, things that are happening. Also something that has been happening uh, so much in, uh, in Uganda has been the, the installation, the police, the Uganda police has been installing the CCT cameras around the city, uh, around different cities. This has, has really brought a lot of uh, criticism. And also we have, we've had also a crisis and a scandal that uh, the police uh, sells the footage you know, uh, that is caught, you know, that is captured from the city, city, city cam uh, cameras, you know, and you see this is uh, a data breach because they are collecting for, and their reason is security. But again, if this, if the police is selling, if the police is giving out uh, the, uh, the, the, the data that they collect from the, from the CCT camera, you see, so this puts our data at risk. And then also, we've also had uh, an issue with the, the motorbike riders. 
where uh, the motorbike, uh, we have a, uh, an app that is used by motorbikes, it's called Safe Borders. You know, we had a scandal where they were sharing people's personal data with Facebook, you know, and this really upset the users without consent, you know, and then uh, something else that also uh, women, another area of data breach that women have also been uh, a part of has been the issue of uh, non-consensual intimate images that most people call revenge pornography. You realize that in, when it is non-consensual intimate images, it means that someone else, a third party shares uh, someone's private images without their consent. And according to the Anti-Pornography Act of Uganda, uh, this, the, the person whose picture or whose video is shared out is, you know, is, is, is penalized for this. No one goes behind and or no one goes ahead to look for the perpetrator who has bridged, you know, the, the data uh, protection laws to share someone's uh, private data without asking. So this is something that we see as a challenge and women, very many women have been, you know, affect, affected by this, uh, this, these practices and the non consensual cases intimate cases have been on a rise. So, so many women have been affected by this. And also we see in Uganda that there's government surveillance that also goes uh, quite high, that the numbers really increase, especially when, they, when election periods are closed. For instance, now government is busy su surveilling, you know, survey, surveilling the online spaces. And this really affects our privacy. We also see that there's increased uh, data collection by you know, IPS in the name of, you know, updating their, their, their data all the time. And we do not know who takes care of this data. When, for how long will this data be collected? So that means even if we have this act in place, not so many people are using, are using this. So I have yes, gone over have, time. Yes, you have five minutes left. Yes, I had, I, I, I hand over to Sandra. To, to, to go on to look at the legal provision. Thank you. Sandra, you can please go on. Thank you so much, please. Um, I will look at the legal, some of the legal provisions in Uganda. So uh, in Uganda, there are really like several laws that uh, infringe on the digital rights and have also been used to perpetrate and um, intimidate uh, internet users. Some of these laws are the Anti-Pornography Act 2014, the Computer Misuse Act, and um, uh, the Data Protection and Privacy Act 2019 and also the Constitution. So uh, these laws have really been widely used uh, to violate um, the individual rights to privacy on the internet, like we have seen Stella Nyanzi. Many times, um, most of our personal information have been shared on the internet. Uh, things like our pers uh, email address, um, uh, for number and even the signature. So uh, people do not really like, um, the, the government do not really look at how this um, information that is shared can also infringe on the rights of, uh, of women uh, online. Yet you see that uh, for Ugandan case, uh, it has been voted as the, 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 uh, the, the country with the best uh, uh, or the favorite uh, ICT laws. But you see that these laws do not really uh, uh, protect women who are the biggest biggest victims of these crimes. And also these laws have been used to charge and also sentence individuals who have been uh, critical of the president like Stella Nyanzi. So there are things that uh, you cannot really like fix um, um, with the law, what has really been uh, determined, uh, damaged by technology. So as we look at all, all these laws um, that are in place to be also, uh, it's also nice to look at other mechanisms that we can use um, to fix some of the breaches um, that women and children face online. For example, the Constitution of Uganda, uh, Article 22, uh, uh, two, uh, 27, two sites that no person shall all be um, subjected to interference with the privacy of that person's home, um, communication and other things. But you realize that um, most of the people who are like digital rights activists and um, journalists, uh, their homes have been broken to, uh, their computers have been uh, stolen and their personal information have been uh, uh, used and also uh, stolen. So the right to privacy um, 
also is further again uh, limited by the Anti-Terrorism Act 20, 2002, which also provides for the inception of communication, specifically looking at Section 19.1, which cites that an authority officer shall have the right to incept the, the communication of a person and other otherwise conduct surveillance of a person under this act. So you realize that uh, this really like tends to give the authority the right um, and also make them feel that it is uh, it is mandatory. It is not a crime um, when you incept on the uh, communication of a person and also maybe surveil. surveil. And when you look at um, on the side of children, um, the, the, the child on light safety, like Peace mentioned, is uh, really uh, being questioned. Like when you look at the, um, the Computer Misuse Act 2011, which proposes tax staff uh, measures for anyone who indulges in child pornography using a computer, or persons who also indulge in cyber harassment, offensive communication, cyber stalking. However, when you look at this act, it also points out to one aspect of online um, child online safety, which is child pornography. And 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 when you go ahead and also um, look at section eight of the data protection and privacy act 2018 on personal data it is also relating to the children says that a person shall not collect and also process uh, personal data relating to children but you realize that um, the, most of the, the the data that is collected um is not uh, children the, the parents, Sandra. The, thank you the parents uh, are not um consented to collect this data and also you see that um, many schools still share personal data of the pupils without their consent. And even the parents themselves, they also share information. This may be because they are not aware that they're doing, they're actually infringing on the uh, privacy of the children. And, and, and also, so I also want to point out something on consent. Um, like this mentioned on the Privacy and Data Protection Act, um, it says that a person shall not collect or, or process personal data without the consent of, um, of the, the data subject. But to realize that as Peace mentioned, um, the act does, is neutral and does not really mention um, the non-consensual intimate images um, as a privacy concern. And, and also the Anti-Pornography Act 2014, which was enacted to curb uh, pornography online and also offline. So this has really, this um, the Anti-Pornography Act has been used to order the arrest of victims of, of revenge porn for the production of explicit um, content and nothing is really done for the perpetrators uh, for the distribution and circulation of um, the videos or pictures of or any personal uh, information. So, um, when you look at the, the anti-pornography, it really like just criminalizes the production and then the trafficking, the publication, broadcasting, procurement, and all that of any kind of pornography. But then the act tends to uh, punish the victims for the production of um, explicit pictures or images, which are in most cases women. And while they do not look at the publication, the broadcasting and trafficking, which is not looked at. So you, as Peace mentioned, um, internet service provider increasingly um, uh, continue to also uh, monitor and also record online activities of people, uh, especially a content that are not uh, encrypted, uh, for especially for the vulnerable uh, groups such as women and children. So um, you see that some of this information can even be used uh, to pinpoint where you live, and also this information, maybe when the government asks for it, can also um, be given uh, to them. So this really tends to uh, infringe on the right uh, of women and children online. So I will go um, next to what ought to be done. Please, could you just uh, move the slide? So um, briefly, um, what maybe could be done is number one is to create awareness uh, on the importance of observing um, data protection uh, and, and privacy. And also it's a responsibility for us all, the individuals, the children, the women, the parents, the organization, the government, even the stakeholders in protecting the data and privacy. And this could be done through like um, initiative like online safety trainings and all that. And since also um, the Uganda already has the data protection and privacy in place, there is also need for regulation to guide on the proper implementation of this law. The government should really have a strategy to monitor the implementation of these laws. 
And then also um, looking at the independence of data protection or uh, director, it is very important. And also the appointment process is, should be is very relevant because when we look at independence, it's also about the appointment. So the appointment should ideally be a, a transparent uh, public uh, participatory process, and it should ideally requ require the approval of the parliament. Focus should really not be on the how the office operates, but it should be really look at the transparency so that um, vulnerable groups like women and children are not um, violated. And then also um, looking at the personal data of um, vulnerable groups, uh, the data collectors should also really build um, very strong um, uh, ethics and politics on consent into the culture, the designs, the policies, the terms of services of internet uh, platforms so that uh, women's agencies really is, lie uh, in their okay. ability. Uh, yeah, I'm concluding. Uh, lies in their ability to make informed decision on what aspect of their uh, public or private lives should be shared online. So I will conclude by saying that um, the right to privacy is really uh, fundamental in the digital uh, age because there is um, a lot of data bridges going on, and then. Uh, when uh, this data is being infringed, other digital human rights could also be infringed upon. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Sandra. Um, I just want to give Peace the opportunity to comment on the issue of um, electronic elections within the context of privacy and data protection. Thank you very much, Dube. I have actually posted a few comments on the chat. Uh, if I, I think he was asking how the literates or other uh, such groups would really manage. So the election is being done. The election would be physical. The voting would be physically, but all the campaigns because of the COVID uh, uh, standard operating procedures, uh, social distancing, and not allowing very many people to come together. So then the campaigns should be digital. And yes, it is so true that uh, people who are not accessing the internet and people who cannot access the ICTs or even have the radio and TVs are really left out of this conversation. So that's really a big challenge and we have been talking about it. Uh, a lot of criticism came out of it and debates, you know, that maybe elections should be uh, pushed forward, postponed, but, you know, government with their interest, that has not been possible. So definitely such vulnerable groups will be left out. Thank you. Okay, I thank you very much, Peace, for the comments on elections. There is a comment again by Sukati, and I think we can give the opportunity to Sukati Menzi. Would you want to elaborate on your comment? We can give you the floor and you can elaborate on your comment. Sukati Menzi. Hello. Yes, please proceed. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. The, the reason that it's because we, we have data which we collect in uh, our. Oh, yeah, we, we do collect uh, on hospital laboratories and it's, it's within the repositories. So I want to know but why do we collect this data and who uses this? this particular data. I don't know if I'm on point, you just caught me off that I was just talking something else. Can you a bit later, I'll just drop it in the comment box. Okay, I think your, your connection is a bit hazy. We can't really hear you uh, clearly. But there is a comment again by um, a question by Muiwa. Muiwa, would you want to take the floor, please? Okay, uh, I think uh, one of the two authors mentioned politics of consent. I think the person was trying to say politics of consent must be built. And I'm a bit curious about that. So what does the author mean by politics of consent? And how will politics be regulated by law? So that's my question now. 
Is it addressed Thank to you. the to the presenters, uh, Priest and and Sandra? Yeah, um, it. I think it's addressed to yeah. me. Okay, please proceed, uh, Priest. So uh, when I mean by uh, the politics of consent, you realize that in the digital space, um, first of all, is uh, patriarchal uh, dom dominated, uh, male dominated. So we tend to see that uh, consent is something that in the digital space that people struggle with, struggle with mostly the men. They think that uh, it is not a requirement uh, for them to ask for consent, maybe to share uh, personal data. We have seen our, like Piz mentioned about uh, the, um, the non-consensual uh, sharing of, uh, of images or videos. So you see that most cases it is the, 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 the women, the, the men that share these things, these images without the consent of the women. So it's for me, I see it's like a political thing that should be challenged uh, by the law. Um, uh, yeah. And at the, at the moment, um, from what you are saying, you are seeing gaps in the Ugandan law. How is the Ugandan law with regards to this aspect of concern? I can take that, Dube. Uh, to, be, uh, to be honest, uh, the law has great provisions, but the implementation is the problem. For instance, it provides for consent to be asked before a data collector collects my data as a data subject. But who is asking for, for consent? When we talk about children, yes, it provides for consent to be asked from children, uh, from their parents or guidance before it is collected. But that is not being done in, pros in, in, in practice. It provides for how we store, how it's processed, how it should be deleted, you know, for what purposes. It provides for a number of things, to be, uh, to be frank. But there are still gaps. And when it comes to uh, implementation, then we see a challenge with that. What we see that is a, a problem is the, uh, it does not really uh, speak about the genders. We feel women are very much left out because yes, if we just put data subjects, when we look at the issue of non-consensual intimate images, this should be uh, provided for in the Privacy or Data Protection Act. But you know, those are some of the gaps that we, point, we, we see. But most of this uh, on how the processing and storage and the rest are really provided for, but we have a challenge with the implementation. Thank you, Dube. Okay, your, your paper also um, looks at um, children's rights to privacy. And, and my question, could you please comment on um, the right, to, the children's rights to privacy and balancing it with parental guidance? or um, the, the right to care for children in the context of Uganda? Uh, so uh, we have that provision that parents should be asked. And like I mentioned, the implementation is really low key. So I think uh, what needs to be done is uh, massive or creating public awareness that parents need to know that, oh, when I share my children's pictures, uh, on the internet, it bridges their uh, privacy, you know. So public awareness is something that needs to really be done. Most times we think that people who live in the rural areas or people who are not educated are the ones who do not have this information. But there's so many people who are like us. You get surprised actually sometimes by parents and how they act when it comes to sharing personal information. So I think uh, what I really would like to point out is public awareness. And then there are other people who don't even know what data is, what privacy is. You know, I have told people that we go to the washroom and lock ourselves, you know, in the physical world. But we do not know that also in, on, on, in the online space, we need to lock ourselves. We need to lock our children, you know. So our practices offline and our practices online are quite different. So we need to really revisit our practices and we need to really share this information widely with people around us, our colleagues, you know, in the community. So public awareness is something that needs to be done. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Peace, uh, for, for your comments. Now we are moving on to our third presenter, Chennai Chair. Um, Chennai will be presenting on um, gendered inequalities 
which is looking at how do we ensure gender transformation law in practice in the age of AI. So yesterday we looked at artificial intelligence, at least from a general perspective, but now we are going to, tonight, Chennai is going to take us through a, the aspect of AI again, but from a gender perspective. And um, a, uh, Chennai Che is a digital policy researcher who has extensively focused on understanding the impact um, of technology in society in order to better public interest in policy. At the moment, she is um, currently working at World Wide Web Foundation. She's a research manager and she focuses on gender and digital rights. And she is also a 2019-2020 Mozilla Tech uh, Policy Fellow, Fellow and she focuses on assessing adequacy of data protection and privacy regulation in Africa, taking on gender and um, data justice perspectives. She has done a lot of research on, um, on ICT access uh, from a youth perspective, internet neutrality, um, and a lot of uh, other related aspects. Chennai Che, I am giving the floor to you. Thank you so much, Lengiwe. I'm just gonna share my screen so that we kick this um, session off. There we go. Okay. Um, yep, so I've been thoroughly introduced. I don't need to reintroduce myself, but just to say that I'm dialing in from Johannesburg and I am a Zimbabwean, so I always navigate the internet space um, in my diaspora identity as well as just being um, regional and global. So to start us off, um, yeah, so my, 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 basically my presentation is on trying to understand gender digital inequalities and then how do we ensure transformative law and practice. So um, locating this conversation in context is quite important because when you read conversations around AI have really been thinking about it from that tech evangelism perspective, where it's kind of like, um, and this is the same trend we followed when new technologies were being introduced into the continent. And the idea is that once you have this new technology, then poof, all our problems are gone. But we exist in a context where, according to the ITU, only only about half of the world is actually connected to the internet. So, you know, the source of data as well. And then in Africa, only a third of these uh, of individuals of the continent actually use the internet. We have a significant um, gender digital uh, gap, which, you know, assesses uh, how many how many times are men more likely than women to use the internet and using our the World Wide Web Foundation's um, calculation based on a women-centered approach, we find that 43% of men are more likely to be using the internet than women in, um, in, the, in developing countries. So then you find that despite these challenges, there's this like conversation of like, we have to have artificial intelligence, how do we do it? So the race to technology, and we can't just focus on access because the reality is we are interacting with these new technologies. They are shaping our everyday lives. So my main concern for this work has really been trying to understand how, um, you know, like the way in which personal information feeds into the development of AI based innovations. And regardless of it being in the form of aggregated data sets, it still shapes the way in which people experience privacy from a gender and sexual orientation perspective. And what can we can be done to ensure people's data and digital rights. So um, this project has also been made possible as part of my Mozilla Tech Policy Fellowship, where then over the last year, I've been trying to, to answer these two main research questions, which were what would a gender responsive data protection and privacy law entail to ensure gen gender transformative um, a gender transformative tech system. Also, how can civil society play a role in ensuring a gender transformative law and practice with a focus on the right to privacy? It's very clear that we really do need civil society to be able to engage in these conversations and to also shape the way in to hold companies and spaces accountable. So I take on um, a feminist approach. And I think as I was listening to everyone's different positions and approaches to this, I think, you know, whichever approach you take, there really is a need to center community and society. So by taking on, I take on a feminist approach, which then um, allows for me to be able to ask who is being represented, what is being prioritized and for who is being valued. And so I make use of, um, 
I created a conceptual framework where I was borrowing from data feminism, feminist principles of the internet, um, the theories of intersectionality, data justice, and I also then made use of a qualitative methodology. So to quickly run, uh, to quickly run everyone through this approach, um, data feminism is a concept, um, a conceptual framework that was coined, that was put together by Catherine Ignacio and Lauren Klein. There's actually an open access book that people can download and read, and in it they provide several and guiding principles and thinking about work with relation to data. So being able to examine power, to challenge power, to rethink binaries, to embrace pluralism, to actually consider context, to make labor visible and elevate emotion. I think this one I just want to emphasize because we, we have been speaking about data as if, you know, we often think about data as if it exists from something and then we forget that it's, it comes from us and it's located in our experiences and everyday embodiment. And also um, embodiment of value and multiple forms of knowledge. So I think as I was speaking to the different speakers, I was quite excited that you know we're not just hearing one particular voice in this conversation, but I am cognizant of the fact that we are missing particular voices that you know would allow for a diverse experience and understanding. Then intersectionality um, is coined by Kimbell Crenshaw and looking at it from perspectives by Patricia Hill Collins and also quite recently Professor Sylvia Tamales' book on um, Afrofeminism and decolonialization. When we take an intersectional approach, it allows for us to look at the layers of inequalities based on the different spaces we occupy. And by this, we then understand the experience of inequality with technology and subsequently the regulations that are adopted so that we push for regulations that are not, um, that are taking into account our heterogeneous differences. And then data justice really centers uh, the experiences of marginalized communities. It makes use of principles across um, varying contexts. The data justice approach privileges um, social conditions and lived experiences of those who are subject to domination and oppression in society. And this ties into what all my previous speakers have been talking about as well. The methodology that I used was more kind of like um, really speaking to people who have, with an understanding of the information regulation space, as well as gender and sexual justice activists, because this is my community that I'm really interested in trying to understand how are they thinking about these issues and how does this knowledge impact on them. So just a quick um, point that the way that I've been approaching this definition and I'm aware of the fact that at the current moment is, there are really many debates of do we even have AI? What really is AI? Have we reached that point of passing the Turing test to be actually be able to say that this system thinks on its own and is able to make its own decisions? So I make use of um, a recent definition put together by the AI, uh, by UNESCO's, by UNESCO in their paper on AI and gender equality, where um, it's simplified, involves using computational power to classify, analyze, and draw predictions from data sets using a set of rules called algorithms. And then as algorithms are trained, the use of large data sets so they can identify patterns, make predictions, recommend actions, and figure out what to do in unfamiliar situations. The ability of an AI system to improve automatically through experiences known as machine learning. So this is just a general um, definition before uh, I get technical you know told how it works so this is what I've been working with in trying to get my community to engage with it and also trying to understand so as, as I pointed out uh, a data feminism approach is quite important about you know the context and also data justice wants to understand those who are in context of already dominions of oppression so I specifically was looking at the SADC model law and um, South Africa as a as like a, a proper analysis of case to understand what, what the experience is. And as you can see, um, in thinking about the context of digital take up, right? The SADC, in SADAC, apparently the levels of internet uptake are 22.3%. And then for South Africa, South Africa is one of the leading um, countries in the region that actually has a very high level of internet uptake, 53%. And then now looking at gender, I think the reality is that in the SADC region, South Africa specifically, we are living in a context of gendered inequality, where um, if you don't have a protest on gender-based violence in Namibia, like uh, like a week, like in the last weekend, you have cases of um, 
every day women in South Africa are being murdered and you know like so there's the extent of gender-based violence which which if we were to assume that technology does not replicate such inequalities we would have a challenge to think that technology is neutral in its development so in both um, at the regional and at a local level there is a move to try to you know ensure that we do not we stop the cycles of gendered inequality. And just to focus on South Africa as well, it's facing the gendered inequality at uh, the triple threat of poverty, um, inequality and unemployment with aspects of race and location playing out as well. So then um, in thinking about the context of, of digital rights, um, as I unpacked this, what I looked at was the SADC model law and um, South Africa's Protection of Personal Information Act. And already there were some provisions that would be important in terms of privacy and data protection in relation to AI, but they do not speak directly to artificial intelligence. So in the previous sessions yesterday, this was noted. I do want to point out something that was concerning and I had hoped my previous speakers might also pick up on it, but this might be um, an opportunity to explore further. In the SADAC model law, there is a provision that allows for the processing of personal data relating to a data subject's sex life um which is and and this is quite alarming given that as the first speaker pointed out not all countries actually have acknowledged that you know you can be gender diverse you can you can you can be part of the lgbti community q community legally so therefore the question becomes um what happens if someone adopts this law and then begins to process this data it's a violation of someone's rights but in those countries it will be considered legal and this is a provision that's still in there in the law. So then moving on quickly, because I realize I've got like about four minutes left. Um, the context of which AI is spoken about is around rather around innovation, development, research, capacity building. Gender is actually identified as, as missing in terms of participation. So you've got very few uh, women and gender diverse people in the process of development of AI, which would then mean if this, if they're not represented, we're likely to then have systems that are being developed that are replicative of inequalities in society. And that's something that actually needs to change. So the focus really is kind of like, how do we make sure that we're economically strong? How do we make sure that we use technology to, to address solutions? And in this instance, I just want to highlight the example of um, Rainbow, which is actually a fantastic uh, technology that was developed in partnership with Soul City in order to be able to address gender-based violence in South Africa, so to use the platform for communication. And so then what I did was try to understand the gendered harms when it comes to privacy, because a key question that I keep getting from privacy practitioners is why gender? Like, is it even a thing? And what we know is that, um, you know, we exist in a world with particular gender stereotypes. So then this comes with problems of privacy inversion and abrogation. Um, I use the understanding of Anita Allen where she talks about uneasy access where that the way in which we perceive women and gender diverse people in terms of like, should they be visible? Should they be invisible? And to what extent this also plays out online as well as um, our socioeconomic status of gender, ethnicity and place of birth actually influence how our data is treated in different contexts and influence decisions from that context. And so then this is just an example of uh, the work over the last year that I've been trying to understand what are the harms and trying to classify them. It's not exhaustive. The paper goes on for a little bit more, but you know, it actually points out the issues around discrimination, about around harassment. Um, I, I was happy when Peace mentioned the non-consensual explicit material because that also AI has been used to generate um, deep fakes. The stereotyping that comes as a result of automated dis of dis decision making, as well as economics harms based on gender bias, where uh, a recruiting system actually then, if it if it picks from different data that you are a woman, you might not be able to see particular ads. But the biggest challenge uh, in my own doing my research is that there isn't enough document, we've got more documentation of opportunities from AI, we don't have enough documentation about the potential harms. So what I then did was I conducted an interview with different with a survey with different scenarios with the gender and sexual justice community that I um, got in touch with. So there was a very personalized survey. And what I wanted to find out were like, what were their perceptions of harms? And it's really quite interesting that the concerns around collection and processing of data, who has access to the information, how the information will be used and where the information will be stored. Thinking about location where it's kind of the fear is if you're an activist and your information is going to 
constantly feeling like it's being tracked? What does it mean when you're accessing those points? Um, the impact of privacy breaches when, you know, South Africa has had quite a few privacy breaches in the last couple of months and the kind of attention that they, that's there in terms of the personal information is to what extent does it have a gender and sexual orientation impact? Concerns with surveillance. Um, I think the biggest example that came out around bias and discrimination and automated decision making was around the banking sector, where then, although some you know race, ethnicity, location, citizenship, and health status can are protected um, points of data, but there are certain other indicators that are used to then develop a profile of an individual, which would then result in one being discriminated in access to finance, as well as profiling um, in targeted advertising. So the concerns around having shared devices, and if you're not out to your family yet, if that information then, um, if an advert comes out because you've searched for particular information because of the profile and targeted advertising, what is the impact? So then to round up, <clears throat> um, what I think about in terms of the solutions that can be done, how do we ensure that we have a law that in place that is gender responsive? And obviously, you know, I think there is an opportunity for an AI specific law or policies to be developed within South Africa. So what then would need to be done is really taking into account context. So context is really key. This is why I was running through that. And um, when you look at the history of development of most privacy laws on the continent, it's really been to be compliant with GDPR so that you ensure business growth. Um, and then also in really important nuancing definition of sensitivities and harms for women and gender diverse communities at different intersectionalities. So taking into account that point of um, disability, taking into account the point of race, taking into account the point of like location and education, and then also designing and implementing laws that, you know, are reflective of power and inequalities. So you, you think about what I mentioned around unemployment, um, inequality, and poverty. Are the laws that we currently have in place designed in a way that says <clears throat> we have solutions that Sorry, <clears throat> we have solutions that are able to tackle those spaces. And then you also have to think about the responsibility of data controllers, placing onus on them to ensure that data practices they have in place safeguard people's rights. I think it's very problematic <clears throat> if our focus is mainly on trying to place the onus on individuals whose data is being collected by someone else to ensure their privacy, yet those who are data controllers and developers of the systems actually know what to do to ensure that it's privacy by design and it's privacy privacy focus. And most of all, it's important to then have auditing, auditing systems in place that take into account gender and, sexu and sexuality issues, because you can't just have an auditing system that then says, does everyone have access? No, we're not all the same. Our experiences are very different. And there are certain principles, of course, that need to be embedded in these laws, um, transparency, fairness, explainability, and accuracy, because the biggest challenge is around the black box um, of algorithms and AI, where you don't understand what exactly is going on. And most of them are designed without that ability for the general public to audit them. And I think what's most important as well, as we've seen with the data breaches that they've happened, is actually building capacity and support for information regulators. Because without that, we might have all of these laws in place, but if, if we don't support the capacity um, and also financial support for them to be able to do their job, what we'll end up having is a very good law that no one can work with. And so to round up, to answer the second question, um, as part of my survey, I think one of the key points that came out and it's important for me for me to note that this survey specifically targeted people who are not in the digital rights community because that's where the change can happen and allows for us to speak to the un um, I call them the unconverted and also allow for that multiple points of knowledge as part of data feminism and the one of the key points that they pointed out was a need for public awareness on opportunities and challenges of AI. Because um, if we if we just speak about it negatively, we might miss out on whole opportunities that it comes with. Participation in policy development. So as policy cycles happen, you know, doing the drafting and the write-up, the importance of actually researching and documenting harms so that when cases do come up, you know, there is this evidence that this has happened. Public campaigns for accountability, which means holding these companies that have this data. We often focus on international companies, the big tech, but a lot of development is happening on the continent. Therefore, 
and in the country. So therefore we need to be able to actually hold them accountable as is the case with Vumatel and CCTV surveillance um, in South Africa. And then also to actually participate in the development of ethical considerations and other mechanisms for accountability. Because without those voices, we might develop solutions that are not taking into account lived realities and are not taking into account considerations of what it means to be able to have a take AI based innovations that do not replicate social inequalities. Um, and on that note, I thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Chennai, for, for the elaborate um, presentation. Um, you touched on quite a number of, um, of, of, of issues. Um, helping us to understand, you know, the, the, the gender dimension. And I'm happy that you are continuing to, I mean, um, elaborate on issues around awareness, which I think are very, are very important. Issues around awareness, issues around um, research. I think uh, there's a lot of research really that needs to be done in, in the area of um, of AI and also issues around um, gender gender justice. So for the for I, I think in, in somewhere in your presentation you mentioned aspects such as um, gender representation um, is is lacking. So I've I've heard people say sometimes you know or most of the times women are not interested. Um, in, 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 in engaging issues such as these. Um, even, you know, when it's a school, a technic, taking technical subjects such as science, women are just not interested. So I just want to understand from you, from the work that we have done, the research that we have done, what has been your experience or what is your perception around uh, the attitude of women and how can we look at that gap? How can we address that gap of, you know, gender not really well represented so um <clears throat> so i think it's probably one of my favorite questions to answer because i often ask what provisions have you put in place that take into account the lived realities for women to be able to participate in these spaces so i'll give you an example i think um only about two years ago the uh internet corporation for assigned names and numbers started providing daycare services for uh, people with families to be able to bring their children so so I think that's an example of thinking about like how do you create a space that then allows for women to be able to thrive. Secondly, it's also um, another example. I remember a, a colleague who implemented a skills training in a rural community. What they found was that the parents were not supportive of young girls because they did not understand what they were learning. So there's also a need to be able to think about it at a community level in terms of if you're going to support women in these spaces at a community level, what are the harms the the social issues that they face, that means that if they do go into these programs, they will either thrive or they will fail. So it's quite difficult for you to have a whole training program for women to be participating in spaces, yet around them, they're const constantly told that you will not go far or we won't invest in your education because you're likely to get pregnant and get married. Not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm, what I'm saying is that that equation of what's, what's the point of investing in you if you're just going to go off into somebody else's household. Then in, th in thinking about like attitude and participation, it's really about how we structure programs and also generally being patient. I think one of the most interesting things that I found is that the levels of confidence that women have is based on how we're socialized and how we're trained in society and also how the extent to which we are, we are I'm going to use this word, allowed to be visible is completely different from the way in which men, and I, by men, I mean usually cis um, heteronormative men. So then that means that you, most people are not investing in those soft skills in policy, in program development. What they're investing in is kind of like, we've set up a technical center, women must show up. If you're not showing up, then you're not interested, but you haven't done a whole ecosystem approach to understand what would make this program work. So I think that's my long and short, like there's wider research that's been done, but um, as Sandra's actually pointed out, really the socialization and the association of technology with people is completely different. But I think maybe one more example, Shlengue, if you allow me. Even when you think about artificial intelligence, the, if you look at the history of artificial intelligence, it's considered as a disembodied effect and then um it's sort of like oh it's 
it's a it's a mind thing and then um from a, a women perspective when we want to understand it from that like embodied experience of like the emotional and the mind then it's considered like we're not taking it seriously enough so then that's where you see like the way in which we conceptualize technology as a male mind thinking only but without taking into account that it's actually a a lived and embodied experience that also then creates hostile spaces for women to participate in. Um, thank you, thank you, Chennai. So when you're looking at um, the the African context, the the framework in in, in Africa, and um, in under the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, we have uh, the special rapporteur on the rights of women in Africa, and then we also have um, a protocol on the rise of, of women in Africa. And uh, my, my question to you is with regards to the framework in Africa, what do you think can be done in terms of AI, in terms of the right to privacy uh, in looking at the gendered aspect? Um, and also maybe you can also point, um, also make reference to not only the African Commission, but also other mechanisms on how they can you know, mainstream issues around gender and, and AI. Yeah, so I'll, I'll actually focus on the, um, the African Commission and I also draw from the um, African Declaration of Internet Rights. I do, and, and as well as the African Union. So in all of these spaces, what is really important is the, the link to why, you know, when you talk about technology, the gendered effect is not just about participation, but also the resultant um, econ economic, social, and political um, limitations as a result of technology in these spaces. And oftentimes when we try to ensure women's rights and looking at these protocols, the, the technical space is often not engaged with. So from my perspective, I think what's important is for people who actually, for more collaboration, for people who work within the digital rights community to actually be in these spaces and setting up um, policies and of engagement. I'll give you an example. Quite recently, uh, we worked on a submission on the domestic violence amendment bill where they had a caveat around um, harassment and online harassment but what was missing in that definition of online harassment is linking the extent to which new technologies not just artificial intelligence may be used to actually um, you know, propel domestic violence. So we were able to make that link of that lived reality of domestic violence from internet internet partners and how in which technology as it develops is constantly used. And now we've actually seen that on the continent, there isn't as much engagement on domestic violence and technology. Slowly but surely, we're now getting the research, we're now getting some laws. So there is an opportunity to be able to link that with the current existing chatter to actually point out that these are areas of refinement that need to be included. But I think it's also that a point that I made earlier of um, being able to nuance context and linking these issues, because oftentimes we think about the offline space as separate from the online space. But as my, my presentation was trying to point out, all of these issues that we have in the offline space are replicated in the online space and um, the harms are translate offline. So the, if, if an algorithm determines that you're not able, you do not qualify to see a job application or to get a loan, it has an impact on how then we live our lives. So I think this is part of the challenge for, to myself and other people who are on the panel as well is how do we translate our work to show that it is a lived reality and it's not such a technical issue, but it's something that we have to we go through daily. Okay, if, if you're looking at other jurisdictions outside outside Africa, um, do we have um, experiences that we can draw from or good practices that we can draw from, at least from what you have been presenting on, you know, linking AI, data protection and, and gender? Yeah, so there has been extensive work that's been done by um, civil society movements, in particular Latin America, so coding rights, digital rights, um, so I'm just saying these names, but I can type them in as well as Derechos Digitalis. Um, and in that aspect, the really the fun, the work has really been trying to highlight um, why these harms, harms are taking place from a civil society perspective, because once again, the conversation from most developing countries and not just in Africa jurisdictions has been kind of like um, the 
technological innovation, right? So there are, in this point, what I'm really focusing on is like the role of civil society in actually gathering the evidence that's they needed to advocate for change. And um, also, I think one of the biggest things has been work by the Feminist Internet Research Network, for example, that has funded research to thinking about AI um, ethics and principles and how they translate into gender work. The reason why I'm focusing also on civil society is one of the biggest challenges and I've been working on access over the last six years is making people understand why gender is an issue. So the main focus is usually kind of like, do we have the right laws in place, place? Do we have the right principles in place? But the conversation of gender is not really critical. I think even in the GDPR that everyone really works with, which is still being nuanced, that conversation is also missing. So that those are some of the examples that I can think of in other jurisdictions. I'm sure there may be more, but I would also be happy to hear them. Um, thank you so much, um, Chennai. We could go on and on. Um, about this this presentation and this particular focus it's um it's it's very elaborate um you know it's a continuous learning process it's a continuous engagement thank you for taking us through um uh, with uh, the ai aspect with the gendered angle so we are thank now you. moving on to um our last presenter our last presenter is um Dando Namane. Uh, from the previous presenters, we have had um, issues around women, children, the LGBTI, the elderly. Now our presentation will focus on social assistance beneficiaries. So we're looking at data protection and privacy for social assistance beneficiaries um, with a particular focus on, on South Africa. Dando Ngamane has an LLM and uh, the LLM focus on labor and social security law from the University of Fort Hare. He has worked as a legal compliance officer from uh, at the University of Fort Hare again. He is lecturing at the same university and he lectures family law uh, and African customary law. And um, he has also presented um, at a number of conferences. So his presentation, like I've said, is focusing on um, vulnerable groups as well, but specifically social assistance beneficiaries. Uh, Mr. Namani, we are giving you the floor. And you have 15 minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chairperson of the session. <clears throat> Can you please confirm whether my screen is visible? Yes, it is. Thank you. Right. Uh, my paper would be, as mentioned, my paper would be focusing on data protection and privacy for social assistance beneficiaries, a South African perspective. The paper first stipulates or brings into light where does the right to social, is, uh, right to social assistance emanate from. The right to social assistance emanate from section 27 subsection 1c of the constitution. This right is catered for under the socio-economic category rights, which are the right to adequate, uh, right, to, right to adequate housing, sorry about that, right to food, water, and social security. Well, the case in question is the well-known case uh, on socio-economic right, which is the government of Republic of South Africa versus Hotbomb it held that socioeconomic rights are meant for the vulnerable, those who can't afford, and those who can't afford and the government policies must be aligned to address socioeconomic related issues. Well, in a bid to realize social security, the, the legislature enacted two legislation or statutes, which is the Social Assistance Act, which was to give rise to the administration of social, of social grants and requirements of social grants, different types of social grants, such as your foster grant, children's grants as well. Then they had, the, they developed or enacted the, social, the South African Social Security Agency Act, 9 of 2004, which primarily gave, right, gave rise to the establishment of the South African Social Security Agency Act, which was to facilitate administer management Manage, manage the payment of these social grants. 
Then South Africa, the South African technology have evolved over the years. And Sasa has been a beneficiary of these technological developments, such as the, digital, the, digital, the digitization of payment of social grant, which inter alia included the introduction of smart cards, which were referred to as Sasa MasterCard. This endeavor was also meant to eliminate fraud related to the payments of social grants. So before, before this technological advancement took place, there were a lot of fraud related payments that were done. Now, the processing of payments requires details of beneficiaries to protect their personal, then to protect their personal data and privacy, legal framework is put in place to protect these beneficiaries from the illegal use of their personal information. You would come to see where I outline or articulate this different uh, legal framework which are put in place to protect information uh, of, these, of these social assistant beneficiaries. However, there are still some notable shortcomings. There are still challenges and shortcomings within the system. Now this is despite the legal framework which is put in place. I then first start by outlining the regulation of social assistance. But before I start so, I define social assistance by the, by the definition of the white paper on social welfare, which was developed, which was developed in, uh, I think in, in, in 1998, if my mind serves me well. But important to note, it provides definition of social assistance as follows that social assistance is a non-contributory non and in, income tested benefits provided by the state to groups such as people with disabilities, elderly people and unsupported parents and children who are unable to provide for their own minimum needs. So it's a non-contributory, but uh, social assistance is a stream of social security law. Social assistance is a stream and emanates, as, as, as previously mentioned, from section 27, subsection one, which, 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 which states that everyone has the right to have access to social security, uh, including if they are unable to support themselves and their dependents, appropriate social assistance. Well, without further ado and wasting time, but this deals now with the regulation of social assistance. Social assistance is regulated through Social Assistance Act and with its sister act, which is the South African Social Security Agency Act. The Social, the so, the social Assistance Act was to provide for the payment of social assistance grant, outline minimum requirements for persons to qualify for social assistance grants. But in order for these social grants to come into effect, in order for payments to be done, the, the legislature saw the need to, to to enact the social security, the SASA Act, so that it could provide for the establishment of the agents which will make payment. Now, the, the course of the Minister of Social Development case highlights the importance of social security, but in particularly social assistance. The primary purpose of social assistance is that the state values human beings and it is, it is to a social intervention for citizens to afford the basic life that they are not able to afford, interesting. I then move to the regulatory legal framework to protect data and privacy of these beneficiaries. You would recall that I made mention that in order for payment to be done, these social assistant beneficiaries need to submit their own personal details. Now, we, now I tend to look at the legal framework which is put in place to assist these, 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 these uh, social assistance beneficiaries. Of course, since in South Africa, uh, the constitution is, is, is the supreme law of the land and section 14, section 14 guarantees everyone the right to privacy. I then quickly move to common law. Common law, before, common law regulated the right to privacy before the before the constitution the constitution assumed this supremacy position in South Africa. Even till to date, um, social uh, the right to privacy still enjoys protection from the common law because there are still recourse which are provided um, or remedies which are provided uh, through common law, such as the actual in 
and actually so the apologies for my Latin word, as well as the interdict, which emanate from common law. Then there's the Electronic Communication and Transaction Act, which also provides, uh, which is meant to regulate electronic communication. It also provides for the prevention of abuse of information, which I argue that is also relevant in, in, in my paper. Then we have the well known, which is well discussed in this conference too, the Protection of Personal Information Act, Popeye Act 4 of 2013. Well, some scholars have termed it as the principal legislation when it comes to, 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 the right, to the right to privacy. And it's there to give effect to the right to privacy, which, which is stipulated in section 14 of the constitution. But important to note is that it applies to both public and private bodies, meaning it would apply to SASA, the agent, which is, uh, which is responsible for the payment of social grounds. It goes further in establishing the minimum standards that applies to, process, to processing of information. Uh, the Popeye Act applies to all information processed entered into record and requires person who's in position of information belonging to someone else to take proactive measures in protecting that information and maintaining confidentiality. So this also is applicable to SASA as an agent, as an agent of, the, of the state to take proactive measures in protecting information and maintaining confidentiality that belongs to the SASA, to the social assistant beneficiaries. Then we, we have also the South African Social Security Agents Act the act that gives rise to the, to the establishment of the agents. Section three, subsection C, read with section 16 of the SASA Act, which states that no person may dispose of a social grant beneficiary information unless there's a court order compelling one to do so. So in order for one or in order for the agency to dispose of the social assistant beneficiary information or information that belongs to the social grant beneficiary, there must be a court order compelling such. Now, there's an interesting case, a leading case or a landmark case around the social, around the data protection and privacy of social assistant beneficiaries, the Black Cash versus Minister of Social Development. Well, the case involved, involved a third party who was responsible for the payment of social grants. That was, it was the, the third party was, which was the company called CPS was uh, awarded a tender. The Constitutional Court found that the tender was invalid, unlawful, and it set aside the tender, but it suspended its invalidity so that they could do a handover process of the payment so that they could roll out payment. But important to note, the, the Constitutional Court, so it's a constitutional decision. The Constitutional Court stated that in the terms and conditions, there should be, in the terms of condition of the contract between, between, between between the Minister of Social Development and SASA, it should contain adequate safeguards to ensure that personal data obtained in the payment processes remains private, important for this paper, and may not be used for any purpose other than payment of the grants or any other papers sanctioned in section. Then it moved on to say it preclude, it shall preclude anyone from inviting beneficiaries to opt in uh, to opt into the sharing of confidential uh, information for the marketing of goods and services. Then it declared that SASA is under the duty to ensure that the payment method uh, is under the duty to safeguard, in fact, to safeguard information that belongs to these beneficiaries. However, despite all of these legal frameworks which is put in place, despite the recent case law, which is the Black, uh, black Search case, but there are still challenges or shortcomings that persist within this area, that persist to haunt the social, uh, the social assistant beneficiaries or challenges that may pose or, in, or continue to pose risk to these beneficiaries. The first challenge, the first notable challenge is that there's a company called NetOne. The company was a subsidiary company to CPS but the company still holds and refuse to give information to SASA, information that belongs to these, um, to these beneficiaries. Now, what's risky about this or what could, be, what could have 
perhaps been illegal in lack of a better word is that so is that the network the net one company is linked to a company called easy pay everywhere which has low bank charges and which has recruited most of its clients from social grant beneficiaries now this raises concern after network net one refused to submit information then uh, after net one refused to submit information but now they have made a lot of recruitment now this happened despite the legal framework to mention the few section three as well as uh, section three of and the standing order of the constitutional court now what i've also discovered is that sasa does not have a well equipped come again sorry please conclude okay okay sasa does not have an it infrastructure what i've also noticed is that there's financial illiteracy on on the part of the sasa beneficiaries um, there's also poor administration lack of effective legal measures i'm trying to wrap up as much as i can uh, then sasa should uh, then there's also or the sasa's personnel or staff members are not well trained in terms of data capturing and legal knowledge that relate to data protection and privacy now i therefore make the following recommendation that it develop its it infrastructure that it must comply with all the legal law with all the legalities that are there as well as the constitutional court decision then there's the information regulator which is established in terms of the popeye act which must monitor compliance or uh, which must monitor compliance on sasa but the regulator should also provide education to social assistance beneficiaries which will enable better understanding of lawfulness but i also recommend that there should be training and awareness on staff members so that they are well equipped with 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 with, with data protection and privacy and laws relating to such I, that brings me to the end of my presentation thank you um dando for the presentation focusing on um beneficiaries of social assistance uh, grants and specifically looking at um, south africa and i think the issue that we are pointing out is not unique to south africa this happens a lot uh in our african context and uh, i just want to ask our participants uh, if they have any questions regarding tando's uh, presentation or comments but uh, my question to you, Ndando, is with regards um, the you mentioned that the information regulator should actually be conducting um, education programs or awareness uh, programs. And looking at the present uh, uh, state of the information regulator, do you think it's, it has the capacity to perform the, the kind of work that you think they, they should be doing? um in, with regards raising awareness and then the other thing is that um when you're looking at beneficiaries of social grants most of them are not educated most of them they are li they live in, in in rural areas and also maybe in urban areas but with uh, lower levels of, of education and um do you think there are any programs at the moment um, and at the moment that are taking place to try and uh, raise awareness among this group, the, the social assistant beneficiaries, because we are like Chennai's presentation, she has mentioned that South Africa has been experiencing a number of data breaches in the last couple of months. And these are vulnerable groups, these are, um, you know, every month, you know, their information is collected, they are collecting their, their, their grants and all. Is there anything that is happening in the capacity of the information regulator? And also, is there anything that is being done targeting the private sector? Because some of this information has been finding its way to the private sector as well. Well, thank you, Mr. Dubey. Uh, in relation to the first <clears throat> to the first question, well, I, I I I honestly do not think that the information regulator has the necessary or requisite capacity in 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 trying to bring awareness to our people or conducting these awareness programs. But 
there's a component which is given rise by by which is given uh, which is given rise by uh, by by the social assistance act the social assistance act has established an in an, an inspectorate uh, to deal with social grants related matters now since i would i would advise and suggest since we have this inspectorate the information regulator should work hand in glove with this inspectorate so that it conduct awareness, so that it conducts education more so to the people, to our marginalized people of in rural areas, our people who are not financial literate and so on. Now, uh, uh, coming to the second question, I'm trying to move fast. Coming to the second question, the, look, the truth be told, and we must be frank about these matters, there hasn't been proper and effective awareness when it comes to social grant beneficiaries. We, in South Africa in particular, we, 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 we treat social grant beneficiaries as if we are doing them a favor, while they should enjoy their social grant payments, which is protected and given rise by Section 27 of the Constitution. Now, it should have been the sole responsibility way before OPI Act came into effect way before there was the establishment of the information regulator. SASA should have conducted effective and well-equipped um, uh, uh, programs that would that that intend on making aware of our people of all of these scams, and so that it also kept whatever information that could find its way to the private sector. We also see we, we even now we still see people who are making loans, people who are who are making loans uh, 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 in, the, in, the, in the private sector. We also see the private sector marketing their products, marketing their whatever, their services to the social grant beneficiary, simply because they are able to penetrate or simply because they, our own marginalized people who are beneficiaries, um, have, 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 have their information have been, temper, have been tempted, tempted with. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uber. Okay. Um... There is another question from uh, Kitty, and uh, the question is, given the issues you have identified, wouldn't all these issues be exacerbated should South Africa ever go to the universal income slash uh, basic income grant route that many of us are advocating for? I, I, I fully agree with the speaker. I fully agree with the speaker. Hence, we should, hence we should not rush in lack of a better word hence we should not rush in moving to the basic income uh, income grant which is which 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 is part of the discourse because we still have issues we still have issues of data protection and privacy with the current social systems social assistance grants which are in place we have not fully addressed to them we have not fully addressed to the to the to the shortcomings of these current which are experienced by these current social assistance so if you extend if you extend the social assistance grant to basic uh, to pay to the basic grant which is which is proposed it simply suggests that we would find more applicants we would find more beneficiaries in 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 the social in the social assistance system which now may create or exacerbate the pro, the, the, the the current problem hence we need an effective a well staffed and capacitated information regulator so that the social assistant agency could work hand in glove with the information regulator as well as the as the as, as the inspectorate as well. Okay, um, thank you. So just one last one. Um, Tiniko is saying has net one still not complied. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, but he's saying has net one still not complied with the order, and if yes. it is uh, still in contempt of court. Why has it not been compelled to do so and deregistered along with uh, uh, easy pay for misuse of personal information and making a profit mm. Of, mm. Um, of social grants by uh, charging the poor and vulnerable interest rates? Yes, just a, qu a quick answer. As you would know, South Africa has or has been lacking in terms of enforcement of judicial notice or judicial orders. Perhaps I guess it's one of the reasons because there is that remedy, it should be held in terms of contempt of, 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 of court, which has not yet been uh, utilized. Perhaps I guess it's one of the loopholes within, within, within the area of social assistance. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Dando. Um, there are comments here, and they are saying um, um, you, the, your presentation has captured well uh, the issues around uh, beneficials of social grants, and it's an insightful presentation. And um, uh, I'm also, I also want to thank the other presenters, um, Chennai Che, Sandra, um, Sandra Aseng, um, or Peace Oliver, um, Obet, and, and Dokas. For, for the presentations today, you really um, yeah, contributed to, to the conference and uh, very elaborate conversations around vulnerable groups. It's a continuous conversation that uh, we will be having um, as we progress with the discussion on privacy and, and data protection. So we are done with uh, this session on vulnerable groups. Uh, thank you to all the participants and all the comments uh, that you have raised. Um, and um, in the next session, which is in an hour's time at 2 p.m. South African time, we'll be focusing on um, COVID-19 and freedom of expression. And my colleague Tomiwa Ilori is going to assist us in moderating um, that session. So, and also we are going to have um, an evaluation um, as we conclude the conference. Um, thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you for participating.